God is good all the time. Well, good morning, church. Are you glad to be here in God's house this morning? I am so glad all of you showed up to worship God with me because, you know, I much rather worship God with a bunch of people than by myself. You know, because my voice isn't all that great and sometimes I get distracted when I'm by myself. But, but being with a group of people who love God, who invited Jesus into their heart and just want the Holy Spirit to work and move in their life and to empower them, there's something holy, something powerful about that when it takes place and we're here. Kurt, did you see what I wore for you today? And you could ask several people, I did it because of Friday night. Your husband threatened to break into my house. Get into my bedroom, go in my closet, steal it, and burn it. I love this shirt. It reminds me of the cruise that we went on. Well, that's just a bonus. Okay? Uh, that's, that's like, you know, that's just extra gravy on my potatoes. Okay? I know I need it. But it is good to have you in the house of God with me this morning. You know, last week was Easter. Seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? But it was just a week ago. And, and usually the Sunday after Easter, a lot of pastors take vacation because a lot of congregation takes vacation. Okay, the Sunday after Easter, you know, Easter everybody comes, right? The church was pretty much packed last week. A lot of people here, uh, people who don't normally come showed up and, and we had a great time worshiping God. But then this week everybody's like, oh, Easter's over, let's just, let's just forget it. But we're an Easter people. You know, we serve a risen God. He just didn't rise on, on Easter morning and that was the end of it. It, it just continues on. And so I, I thought about all that this week and I thought, you know what, let's, let's look what happened a week after Easter. A week after Easter, what, what went on, okay? So if you have your Bibles, you go to John chapter 20, and it's going to start on verse 24, and Gene, it's actually on the screen today. There it is. Look at that. I'm trying to make it snow. Is it okay if I open another window? It is hot in here. I need a little cross breeze going. Oh, looky there. That feels a lot better. So John chapter 20, starting on verse 24, um, it, says, it says, Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Jesus did many other miracle, miraculous signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The disciples, if you go back just a paragraph before why I started reading your Bibles, it talks about Jesus coming in and appearing to his disciples for the first time. And apparently Thomas wasn't there. He was somewhere other than with the disciples in the house who, who were gathered together. And so he missed the miraculous appearing of Christ to the disciples the first time. So I thought it'd be good if we just looked at Thomas this morning and, and took some lessons from him, something that we could learn from him and his, his reaction to the death of Jesus. Okay, the first thing I notice is that Thomas isn't there. That's pretty obvious, right? Thomas is gone. He's nowhere to be found. Thomas is a lot like many Christians. I mean, what just happened to the disciples? I mean, really, what? think about a week and a half ago when Jesus was arrested and crucified and killed. The disciples were beside themselves. They didn't know what to do. Their, their, their friend, their rabbi, their, 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 it, was, it was gone. 
their Messiah was taken from them. And they didn't know what to do. They invested three years of their life into following this man, into being his disciple, to learn from him, and thinking that he would be the one who would deliver them from, from all the Roman authority. But something happened, and it didn't go according to their plans. And so Thomas can't figure this out, and the rest of the disciples are gathered together. But remember, we're like Thomas. We're a lot like Thomas. Instead of gathering together as a body of believers, like the rest of them did when Jesus first appeared, Thomas goes off by himself. Instead of, at a time of need, gathering around other people who, who believe like he did, their friends who could encourage him and they could lean on one another, what Thomas does is he goes to a place of solitude. Now, is that a bad thing? Not necessarily, but, but many of us do this to the point where we just, we just try to ignore what's going on. And we get into this, this, this frame of thinking that in our mind we can't picture anything else but the misery that we're enduring. Instead of trying to look at the big picture, how God's going to work it all out. And see, so Thomas is, is by himself. He separated himself. And that's not good because I, I, I believe that the first thing that any Christian should do when they have a hard time, when something bad happens in their life, is run to other believers for help and support. But we don't do that, do we? We want to keep it a secret. We don't want to share with anybody because they'll tell everybody, well, what's wrong with telling everybody? Hey, you know what? Bobby's having problems. We need to pray for her. But the reason we're afraid is because instead of saying, Bobby needs prayer, we're going to pray for her, we say, oh, let's pray. We say, well, what's wrong? What'd she do now? We, we want to gossip, we want to add to it, and we want to build it up. Instead of just being caring and compassionate loving, we, and praying and helping out, we want to know, well, how'd you mess up? Or what went wrong? Who's to blame? You know, sometimes there's nobody to blame. It just, life happens. And we need to gather around other believers to, to hold and to, and to connect together. To lift us up and to hold us tight when we cry. To allow us to be weak, to allow us to be hurt. And as the rest of the disciples and the ladies were gathered together, talking about what happened, pondering and wondering what would be next, would the Roman soldiers come after them now? Did they misunderstand what Jesus was saying? Did something go wrong? Was God mistaken? They're throwing these ideas back at each other. Thomas is off by himself, maybe having a pity party. I, w I wasted three years of my life. I thought I knew what I was doing, and here I am. I'm lost, and I'm lonely. But Jesus isn't done with Thomas yet. The disciples come to him, and they say, you know, Thomas, where were you? Jesus was here. He's alive. And Thomas, you know, he, he, instead of saying, oh, really? I, man, I wish I'd have seen it. Tell me more about it. He says, I don't believe it. I think you're lying to me. You're, you're kidding me because nobody comes back from the dead. He says, unless I see it myself and, and physically touch the wounds on his hands and his side, I'll never believe it. Wow, does that sound like us? I don't know how many times I've heard people tell me, you know, that I want to believe in Jesus, but I can't. Because I can't see Jesus. I can't feel Jesus. I can't touch Jesus. If God would just allow me to just reach out and, and to touch him, then I could believe what they want is Jesus with skin on. Doesn't that sound like a lot of people we know? Maybe it's you. You can't see God working in your life or any situation in your life. He's just not there. Hmm. I think it's a lot like us, you know. But I'll give him credit. Thomas refused to believe something that others told him just because they told him. Okay, and that's probably a good quality. He was strong enough in his doubts. This is going to sound weird. He was strong enough in his doubts not to be fooled by what somebody would say. I mean, just because you say it doesn't mean it's true. He says, I, I have to see for myself. I have to, to understand and know for myself. And so Thomas is, is, is steadfast that way. He says, unless I see, unless, unless I, you prove it to me. He says, I, I want to believe you, probably. This, Thomas is 
predicament. I can see it because he's a lot like us. I want to believe, but I can't believe just because you say so. I mean, let's, let's step back. Let's, let's put this into our life for a second, okay? Let's say that something terrible just happened to you, okay? You had a terrible tragedy in your life, and, and, and I come to you as a pastor, and we pray, and I said, you know what? It's, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. Jesus is here with you. Jesus has it all under control. You going to believe me? Probably not. I mean, you, you may believe the premise that it's true, that Jesus does love you and does care for you, and he's going to be there for you, but in your pain and your sorrow and your, and your state of mind, you don't see him working. You don't see him there, and you really just, until he does something, I, I want to believe, but I can't believe. Something's stopping me from believing. And see, that's, what, that's where Thomas was. He says, you know, man, I, I really want to believe what you guys are saying, but I, I just can't go on what you say. Because, I mean, think about it. No one had ever raised from the dead. He saw him crucified. He saw him die. They saw him taken down from the cross and buried. And there's no way anybody ever comes back from that. Man, I want to believe, but I can't. Have you been there? Maybe you're there right now. I want to believe that no matter what's going on in my life, no matter what my family's done to me, no matter what's happening in work, no matter what's wrong with my health, I want to believe that God's going to work it all out, that it's going to be for His glory and my benefit. But you know, right now, I just don't see it. And I want to believe, but I, I just can't. But God's not done. It says a week later, much like today, a week after Easter, Thomas is there with the, with the other disciples. They, for some reason, he, he came around. Maybe they were having breakfast together. Maybe he just had enough time alone and he just wanted, to, wanted a little bit of company. But it says a week later, while it, later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. That the doors were locked, Jesus stood among them. And Jesus, he says, peace be with you. Just a greeting Jesus says, you know, don't worry, it's me. That's cool, I'm here. Uh, and then he says to Thomas, he turns right to Thomas. Because he understands that Thomas has doubts. He understands that Thomas wants to believe but is having trouble with faith. So he looks right at Thomas, and he says, you want to believe, brother? Come on, touch my nail marks. Put your hand to my side. Touch. Feel. Believe. And I love what Thomas says. He says, my Lord and my God. A profession he knew because he saw Jesus. He knew who he was. My Lord and my God. My Lord, the one who reigns over him. His God. The one who created him. The one who loves him. The one who sustains him. My Lord and my God. And then Jesus gives him a lesson. He said, then Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Thomas, this isn't right. He says, but blessed are those who haven't seen and yet still believe. Now, chances are, if you're, if you're like Thomas and you really want to see Jesus with flesh on, you're not going to see it this side of heaven, okay? And God understands that you, that you have those desires, you have those kind of needs. But he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, who understand that God is powerful enough to do these things. Wow. I can see us in every aspect of Thomas. We may not be Thomas every time a situation occurs, but, but we've all been there. We've all had doubts. We've all had, had uh, misconceptions about God's power, about his strength, about his willingness to, to reach out and touch our lives. And God says, that's okay. You can do that. You can be that way. You're allowed to have doubts. You're allowed to have fears. But always be open, always be ready for God to prove himself to you. And what happened when Thomas found out that what he had been told about Jesus was actually true? When Jesus says, okay, Thomas, you need proof, here's the proof. Touch me. He went all in, didn't he? He says, my Lord, oh my God, you're there. It's really you. It really happened. He was all in. So, so here's, here's the last lesson that, that we can learn from Thomas today is that it's okay to have doubts. 
It's okay to, to question God. But when he proves himself to be true, when he proves himself to be who he is and what he says he is and to do what he says he'd do, then we need to be sold out for God. We need to throw it all in. Say, Lord, I, I'm for you. And never go back. Because God is always faithful. Always, always faithful. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never stop loving you. He'll never stop watching out for you. Thomas, wow. Doubting Thomas, we call him. And we always give him, give him that bad rap, but we are Thomas. Here it is a week later, you know, and people were all excited last week. You know, we had uh, Good Friday. We had Palm Sunday. We had, you know, all these things. People getting excited about Jesus. Easter, he rose. And then a week later, how's your life with Christ? Are you still excited that he rose for your sake? Are you still on fire that God loves you so much and he's watching out for you? You know, th this past week, ever since Easter, um, and, and I was blaming it on the, the, the medicine I'm taking for the pain that's been that way, but I don't think it's that. I think it's just that since last Sunday, I have been extremely emotional. Let's just say that. Extremely emotional. Um, about things. You know, I get, I get overwhelmed and choked up when I think about the blessings in my life, about the, the goodness that God's blessed me with. When I see somebody in pain, I get, I get, I get empathized with them and then I get all choked up for I feel their pain and I want God to, to remove it. And it's because I know that, that God is a God who loves so greatly that he wants all of us to live a blessed life. But too many of us are like Thomas, doubting that God can do and will do what he said. I mean, Jesus told them, I'm going to be gone three days. I'm going to be buried three days, but I'm coming back. Thomas couldn't believe it. But unlike Thomas, we don't want to believe the proof. Even when God shows himself to be true, even when God says, you know what, okay, here's the proof that you need to believe in me. We don't accept it. And if we don't accept it, then we can't go all in for him. And, and if we don't go all in for God, then we live life for our own terms and for our own selfish desires. And that's really no way to live. It just leaves us empty and hollow. What I find amazing is, after this, this episode with Thomas, you don't hear about him again. You don't hear about Thomas anymore. Now, if you read... Uh, some of the historical books, there is a, 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 I don't know if it's called The Gospel of Thomas or The Infancy of Thomas. There's, there's a book about Thomas and about his life after this incident. And uh, it's not to be trusted completely, but it gives you a good, maybe this happened. I mean, it's not scripture, but it's, it's some of its historical facts. And it says that Thomas was chosen to go to uh, India to preach the gospel. And he didn't want to go anywhere but there. But once again, Jesus proved himself to be true to Thomas. And he went, and because he went to India, Christianity made it clear of that continent. True or not, I don't know. Fascinating stuff. But if it is true, it just goes to show that Thomas, when he said, my Lord and my God, he went all in. He was willing to go anywhere that God wanted him to go. As long as he knew that it was God sending him. So, what about you? What doubts do you have? What, what um, fears do you hold that God's not going to provide for you? That he's not going to deliver you from? What situations in your life do you feel that you have to control? That you have to, to be master over? My question is, why do you want to be? <laughs> because, I mean, speaking from life experience, whenever I want to be in control of a situation that's not so good... It doesn't make me too happy. It doesn't make me too thrilled. It doesn't make my life real easy. But those times that I just say, okay, God, I don't understand it. I hate this time. I hate this situation. But I'm trusting you. I'm going to give it to you. And I'm going to give it to you over and over because I'm going to keep taking it back. But I'm going to keep giving it to you, God, because I don't want to have to handle it. But I know you will. 
It's those times when, when I find peace and relaxation and, and I can accept the situation. I don't like the situation, but I can accept it. And God has always proven to be faithful and true. He's always taken care of every situation in my life. Every single thing. Because if I take care of it, you know what my main objective is? How am I going to get through this? How am I going to benefit from this? How's it going to disrupt my life? You know, or maybe, what will other people think of me? Those are wrong questions to ask. When something happens in our life, we should say, well, how's God going to glorify himself through this? How's the blessing going to come fall on me because I'm giving it to God to handle? Yeah, I have doubts sometimes. I don't know if God really wants to do this or, you know, is he going to handle it in my time frame or his time frame? Or is he going to handle it my way? I don't know. But when God proves himself to be true, I believe him. And every time I believe him, I'm like Thomas, I want to be sold out more for God. And so I, 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 I want to go deeper with God. And it's easier to give things over to God. How it's going to work out. God always takes care of us. He always will. So whatever your problem may be, self-inflicted or enemy-inflicted, life-inflicted, give it to God. Just let him go. He's, he's risen. I mean, he defeated death, hell, and the grave. If he can defeat that, he can take care of your little problems, right? He takes care of all of our problems. So let's believe in God, and let's know that we're an Easter people, and it didn't end last Sunday when we left church. It's every day of our life. Jesus is alive and well, and he's, and he's fighting for you. Let's pray. Everlasting and gracious God, thank you, Lord, for delivering us from ourselves from allowing us to have doubts. Lord, we thank you that you, you don't count it against us when we, when we have questions, when we have fears, when we have skepticisms, and when we're pessimists, Lord. But Lord, help us to, to overcome them. Help us to gather together as a family of believers and to lean on each other, to share with one another, and to really help one another, Lord. Not condemn, not condone, not do anything else, just love on one another. Lord, just help us to be the body of Christ. Help us, Lord, to have faith in you alone because you are our deliverer. You are our God. You are our Lord. Help us, Father, to be all in for you. In you alone we pray. Amen. Amen. To lift your